Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Hey guys, welcome back. Today is March 28th, 2018. You're listening to our second Human Factors Cast Healthcare Symposium bonus episode. I'm your host, Nick Rome, and I'm joined today live from the Healthcare Symposium by your my good friend and yours, Mr. Blake Arnsdorf. Hey everybody, how's it going? Hey Blake, and also on the line we have Elise Hallett. Hi everyone, how's it going? It's going well. Elise, so you haven't been on the show since episode 42. That was May 2017, almost an entire year. What's been going on? Oh, you know, just staying busy in the human factors world. Well, good, because we're going to really rely on you for this one. Blake, I know you spent most of the day kind of networking and doing the professional side of things, but at least you went to a lot of different panels today. So we're going to be kind of uh, relying on you a little bit more for some of the the content. Um, But Blake, what's been going on in Boston? I'm curious as to uh, what's been going on with you. Yeah, so Nick, you're definitely right. I spent most of the day kind of, you know, trying to catch up on work, plus do a little networking, and I got an awesome opportunity to actually meet one of the listeners of the show today here in Boston. We sat down and had coffee with Elise as well. Uh, and that's Brian, uh, who's local to local to Boston. And he's just uh, another guy that's trying to get into human factors. And just, it was really amazing to sit down with him and have an awesome conversation about like somebody else interested in the field from a different perspective. Cause he actually comes from much more of an industrial design background. Uh, so that was really fun to like pick his brain about processes that he deals with inside of his work. Um, but also a big thank you to him for anybody who's listened to the bonus episode from yesterday. He actually took the time and helped us out fixing the audio. So again, a big shout out to Brian and thanks for meeting me for coffee. It was a good time. Yeah. So just to quickly touch on that audio from yesterday, Blake, you had some scheduling conflicts and we kind of had to, uh, kind of make it work because I wasn't in the studio at the time and, and, uh, so we we used a third party app, actually one that you recommended on the show, Anchor, that makes podcasting easy. And uh, you know because we used that third party app, and we didn't have any professional quality um, equipment with us, that that kind of uh, degraded, I guess, the quality. But but thank you to our we have the best listeners, man. Brian really saved our skins there. We re-uploaded the file. So if you heard it like uh, towards when it when it first. When we first dropped it, it might be better to go back and listen to it if you were having trouble. But Elise, I want to check in with you. So how has your experience been over there at the Healthcare Symposium so far this year? It has been absolutely fantastic. Um, I love this conference because it's it's one of those conferences where you have a whole bunch of different people from different backgrounds coming together. So you've got human factors, students, academics, researchers, uh, you have practitioners who are out in the field working with manufacturers, you have doctors and nurses and physicians, like all these different people coming together, um, you know, and you get these really rich discussions during some of these panels because you have so many different backgrounds and and perspectives trying to, to tackle the same problem of how do we make healthcare safer? How do we help um, ensure patient safety? So it's just, it's such a neat conference to come to. Great. So why don't we jump into some of the panels that you went to today? And I, I, I feel like these can just kind of be a discussion. You can kind of let us know what the gist of the panel is. And if Blake and I have anything, I guess, worthwhile to say or interject with, we can we can jump in and kind of talk about those points. So first up on the list here, you have electronic health records solving the little data problem. Yeah, so this one was actually part of a larger panel called the Innovative Interactive Technologies. Um, So if that's not intriguing enough, (laughs) the talks that I'm going to be talking about are actually um, really, really interesting. So this first one comes from a company in um, Dayton, Ohio, I believe. It's a startup called Mile 2, and they were taking a look at electronic health records, which recently have been a really big um, topic of discussion in healthcare because it's a really interesting challenge of how do you take these paper forms that we've been using traditionally and put them into an electronic version in a way that's not cumbersome to the physicians while still 
capturing all the information. Um, and this particular individual took that concept a step further by saying, instead of just trying to copy these forms where it's just simply a data in, data out type of structure, um, he looked at how can we use some of these inputs to better help the physicians um, interpret the data because right now a lot of it's stored in their head. And, you know, there's a question of, you know, if I change this number, how does it impact this other number? And so he kind of brought it together in a dashboard type display using um, a few different algorithms to um, better help that decision making um, that physicians are trying to make. And um, what was so interesting about it was that uh, when they went out and talked with subject matter experts, they started using their tool to explain a possible diagnosis that they would give to a, a user or a, a patient. Um, they'd manipulate some of the numbers and see, well, you know, based off this, this is how this would change. And they could interact with it right there to explain the diagnosis, explain the rationale of why they're prescribing a, a particular way forward for the patient. So um, I thought that was just a really creative way of taking this electronic health record problem a step uh, further to better help uh, the physicians with their decision making and not so much focus on how to capture all the information. So, so let me jump in here. Was, Sure. So, so let me just ask. So, they are taking these these physical papers and digitizing them. Are they using any sort of technology? Um, uh, it, it it seems like this technology is built on top of that um, uh, electronification of the physical copy and 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 really building on top of that, right? And and it almost seems to me like you could use this method for data that's already digitized or or data that that goes into the system as a digital uh, record. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was actually one of the questions that popped up today. Um, so right now it's not hooked up to any kind of records. It's not hooked up to a way for um, physicians to enter in that information and store it with a patient health record. Um, but that is the idea, the vision of taking this a step further to um, better integrate with, um, you know, the, the patient's health record and, and marrying the, the two together, that database where they're putting all the information and, and maybe using this easier interface as a starting point for that. That actually really brings up an interesting kind of point, because I know in San Diego, I, I can't mention the name, but I worked with a couple of guys that are in the startup world that are trying to deal with the more back end problem of the databases that exist for electronic health records and how you can interact with them across health providers. And this like putting these two companies together would create like a very, it sounds like cohesive product, like having the back end already developed so that they can interact across multiple different types of databases that exist for electronic health records, but now putting like a, a good face on it. Uh, so that's a, that's an interesting kind of take on how healthcare is moving forward in different directions, trying to both give you a UI that's, useful that both helps with doctor's decisions, but also like maybe gives the patient a little bit of insight into what their treatment's going to overall, how it's going to overall improve their health, but also like solving the technology problem in the background. Mm -hmm. And there's actually a prototype online. If you uh, go to this company's website, um, again, it's, uh, where did I write it? Mile 2. Mile 2 is the company. So if you look up their website, they've got a prototype online for you to check out. So let me just ask one more question here. So I, I'm not sure I'm getting this entirely right, and and please correct me if I'm wrong. So are they are they foregoing the digit digitization of the the medical records entirely, and they're just kind of saying, um, you know, like here are the things that are going to help physicians interpret data and and not copying the whole thing. So that's a good question, and. Um something I didn't get full clarification on. My understanding is that it's uh, meant to supplement that. Um, so it's, I think, for a specific context of, um, uh, you know, health-related instances. So I don't think it's meant to replace that. Um, and I don't know, uh, you know, I think there are definitely next steps of, of where some of those other fields go. This was, I think, more a first a step with a particular diagnosis. Okay. All right. Great. Well, did, is that 
everything that you wanted to mention about this one? It's everything I had. There's a lot to cover, Nick. Okay. All right. Well, if you say so. We got we got a lot to cover. Let's get into it. This next one is Augmented Reality, The Future of Medic Training. Now, this one really interests me, so I'm, I'm going to pay careful attention to this. <laughs> I knew it would because of the augmented reality component. Um, so just to give you a bit of history, uh, back during the Vietnam War, there were a lot of injuries that were documented that could have very well been prevented um, but the, the combat medics weren't trained on intervention strategies for some of these um, uh, diagnoses, especially the ones where it was harder to diagnose um, based off the external symptoms. You know, it wasn't really obvious. They weren't like bleeding out anywhere. It was a lot more subtle. Um, so the DOD stepped in and created a particular training called the TCCC training that focused on um, training these intervention skills. So giving combat medics the skills to treat some of these more subtle diagnoses when they're in um, in theater. But uh, a lot of these skills, the, the diagnosis skills, recognizing the symptoms and um, is especially over time, these are taught right now in a classroom setting. And so uh, soldiers will go to this classroom setting, learn about these symptoms, and then go into a lab setting and work with a mannequin um, to then train up on these intervention skills. And so this um, decreased the number of deaths related to these types of um you know, medical emergencies quite significantly. But um, now they're looking to uh, better improve that by uh, better marrying together these um, recognition skills and diagnosis skills and the intervention skills together. So they did that using AR. Um, they teamed up with uh, Ohio State and um, a, a mannequin company and um, basically used uh, this mannequin as a, a physical representation of a patient and um, layered AR on top of this patient. So the mannequin was pretty realistic. It could bleed if they needed to. They could um, perform some of these skills on the patient, but it was hard to alter the physical components of the mannequin, like uh, simulate someone paling in color, for example, over time because they weren't getting enough oxygen. Mm. And so that's where the AR came in. And these... Um, combat medics would, you know, wear uh, the AR goggles and view the symptoms change over time. And so now they could see the uh, critical symptoms for diagnosing some of these conditions in context. Um, you know, for example, they talked us through a proliferated lung as an example, and uh, she had a demo up. It was so interesting. Um, but you could see, you know, if you come to a certain angle, you could see one side of the patient's chest moving up and down normally and the other side um, just slightly uh, uh, decreased in that motion. And, you know, so subtle cues like that, and you could view it over time. And so with the AR component, you can see that change. Um, and they also did work to ensure uh, mapping between the mannequin and um, the AR, augmented reality body, so that uh, if the, the uh, person who was in the training moved the mannequin, then the AR component would move as well. So um, through this, they were able to simulate um, a few different uh, challenging scenarios that combat medics would experience in theater so that they could... Um, you know, learn how to diagnose and work on these intervention skills all at the same time so that that learning curve uh, decreases when they go out into uh, theater. Now, that's that's really something else. I got to say, that's really cool use of augmented reality. I mean, Blake and I talk about it on the show quite frequently that the future of augmented reality and virtual reality is not games. That's kind of what everyone thinks of when they first hear of these types of technologies. But really, it's these types of applications that are going to change the world for the better. Um, and and these are the applications that will really catch on and, and sort of progress the technology over the next couple uh, years. So I have to ask, do you know what kind of uh, technology they were using were they using a head mounted display was this through the phone um you know what kind of device were they using to actually interact with the mannequin itself 
Nick, I knew you were going to ask me this question, and I did not get <laughs> the information. I know that it was a headset. Okay, so it was head-mounted. You don't know mm -hmm. what brand it was. That's fine. I just wanted to know, like, was it an immersive experience where they could actually see the thing, um, and, and it's almost like a masked view of their vision, or were they using a tool like, like a like a tablet or a phone where they basically aimed it at the mannequin? And because I mean, those those vary uh, greatly in what you can get out of them. Absolutely, and also with the amount that you can interact with the patient, right? Um, so with the head-mounted display, they were able to um, look at this mannequin and looking at the demo, I mean, the augmented reality was perfectly overlaid on this mannequin, you know, like minus the shoulder area. Um, but so you virtually couldn't really see the mannequin that much when you're interacting with it. Um, so that left the patient's hands free. And then also um, along the lines of the immersive question that you had, um, there would be an instructor present, but... Um, they built in uh, ways that the instructor could interact with this trainee in such a way that wouldn't break that immersive component. So there was actually a um, medical expert avatar who was built in um, that the instructor could use to cue the trainee um, of certain things. If the trainee didn't look somewhere, or if they didn't collect some piece of information, then this avatar would be there and and could cue the the uh, trainee with things like, Oh, have you checked breathing recently? Or, you know, things like that. That's really cool. So it's almost like this, uh, this extra tool within the augmented environment itself to, to aid these, uh, combat medics in, in these tasks that they're required to do. I mean, we saw a couple years ago at HFES, there was a, there was a guy who was presenting some, um, results on these integrated tutors and it was, I wonder if they're using any of that technology in this because uh, he was in the DOD field as well. Um, yeah, this is all really interesting, and, and uh, obviously I, I'm geeking out over it because it's VR stuff. But, uh, Blake, what are, what are your thoughts on this? So I thought that the, uh, the introduction of the extra, the extra physician actually in the immersive experience ha was a really unique take on some of this training because, I mean, if you – if you think about having somebody else watching you and giving you cues, it can really break you out of how well you're paying attention to the mannequin or whatever's going on. Because the, the beauty of what it sounds like this was doing is, is outside inside the classroom, you would only hear about and maybe see some pictures of what the transition through this kind of pulmonary or issue with the perforated lung would look like. But here you're watching it play out over time. You're getting cues from, somebody that's like at a higher level on what to do or what to be checking. So you're helping develop this mental model of what you would possibly be looking for and doing in a real life situation. Uh, so I just, I don't know. This was, these are my types of, or my favorite types of applications of AR or VR where it's in this learning context because it, it just, it seems like it has such a wide range of benefits from getting those mental models to really build up with a low cost to, to anybody in this case for like anybody's life or in per potentially time with a giant like uh, learning increase at the end of it. Yeah. And I think that you touched on something really important there, building up the mental models. Um, so the presenter who was talking talked about rapid recognition skills, which are <clears throat> composed of perceiving the symptoms, having the mental models to back up what you're perceiving, and then developing a course of action depending on um, the mental models that you have built up. And so part of you know that avatar and this training in context is giving that person those uh, the skills to recognize those cues in context. Cause you know, as we know, it's, it's a little bit disjointed when you're in a classroom setting, staring at a textbook versus looking at someone in real life. Yeah. Well, I, this again is super exciting to me and I, this makes me applications like this make me more interested in the topic of healthcare. Cause I, I was mentioning on the show yesterday, I'm not very well versed in that field it's it's a whole sub culture of of uh, all these technologies and and uh, processes and procedures that i just i have no sort of awareness of and uh but but applications like this kind of make me want to investigate a little more 
Um, I agree, Nick. And actually, <laughs> I could say the same thing about augmented reality and virtual reality. <laughs> because the applications in healthcare before have been, oh, well, there, there's hearing talks about this, I think, where it really marries the two um, you know, domains together, it's just, I don't know, the opportunities, the possibilities are limitless. Yeah. And we've seen a lot of the intersection here this year at the Healthcare mm-hmm. Symposium, right? Because Blake was talking about on Joe, the applications of uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence and, you know, virtual reality and healthcare and all these sort of different uh, fields intersecting, and that is what Human Factors is about to me. It's it's about this multidisciplinary uh, field of research that you use different technologies and different techniques to just make things better. Absolutely. And actually, I wasn't going to bring this up originally, but it's perfect segue for bringing this up. I was in a different talk earlier this week um, that dealt with, um, you know, we talk about augmented reality with training and research, but in this case, it was actually used in an evaluation context. So conducting a formative evaluation with, in this case, it was a medical cart that would sit next to a patient's bed. Um, and so it was really interesting because right now, if you're testing a, a hardware component, you could either have a very, very simple prototype um, which just gets at the shape and dimensions, but not really the interaction points. So it's kind of hard for people to understand how they're going to interact with it. Or to test out this um, prototype, people just print it on a piece of paper. And so the the people that they're testing this with are like, oh, based off this piece of paper, I guess that looks good. But what this group did was actually have one of those simple prototypes and use augmented reality to overlay Um, those interaction points. So the user could, you know, still interact with this prototype while reducing some of the cost on the manufacturer side to test out um, different possible hardware designs for this particular cart. So it's a lot of applications, I think, in healthcare, and it's moving um, quite quickly now. Yeah, lots of stuff. Oh, go ahead, Blake. Are you all good? At least when you're talking about interaction points here, what does that really mean in the context of this AR design? Uh, You know, that's really anything from, you know, buttons, brakes, uh, you know, any point in that interface where the user is coming and, um, you know, interacting with the equipment. See, that's that's kind of what I was thinking you were talking about. And that's even, I don't know, kind of lends to both these examples, the medic with the medic and also with this cart. I mean, that's a giant advance in the ability to not only provide an AR experience that gives you that visual feedback of what something would look like, but now we're talking almost about what happens tactically or tactically, sorry. Uh, so it, I don't know, this experience in VR and this addition to like rapid prototyping and with things like that are out there like AR kit that make it very easy to kind of integrate it into rapid prototypes. I just, I think this is going to become kind of part of the toolkit for a lot of companies when it comes to, especially these manufacturers that are testing real devices or much more physical products. So I just think it's really cool that that's, that was actually a workshop portion for this, um, for this healthcare symposium. All right, guys. Well, I, I know we could talk about this topic all night because this is so interesting. But, I, okay, you have more notes in here. You have a lot more notes in here, Elise. I want to make sure we have time to cover everything. So next up on the list, you have FDA. I'm going to mess up all these acronyms, by the way. FDA, CDRH, CDER panel. What are all these acronyms? I'm dying to know. <laughs> well, I mean, you work with the government, Nick. You understand the, the need for acronyms. I do. I do. Uh, yeah, yeah, acronyms. <laughs> yeah, so these, so the FDA um, oversees, you know, as we know, the validation of different medical devices, um, drugs uh, that are being released to the public. And ultimately, their main objective is to ensure safe and effective use for, you know, the public. Um, so there are two different centers through the FDA. There is the Center for Devices and Radiological Health, um, also known as uh, CEDAR which is the CDRH acronym, Um, and they're much more uh, focused on these standalone devices, Um, whereas the other acronym that you saw is the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research. 
um, or CDER, and they are much more focused on what is called a combination product. Um, combination product, there are a couple different examples, but the main focus um, in a lot of the different talks that I was at was when you combine a drug and an actual device. Um, so you can think of like an insulin pump, for example, where it's administering some kind of dosage into the patient, but then there's also some um, device that the user's interacting with. So uh, they are two separate centers, two different uh, places for uh, manufacturers to uh, get their devices approved, depending on uh, the device and, and some of the certain pathways with it. Um, but this was another really interesting component of this conference in that you have manufacturers who are trying to get FDA approval based off of the guidance that the FDA releases. And then you have the FDA all there in the same room talking about, you know, common questions. What can we learn from each other? Where are the gaps, um, particularly in the guidance as we're experiencing it? Um, I know in your podcast, one of the big things that you bring up are, is it depends, right? Um, it depends on the device. It depends on the, the users. It, it, it depends. And I think that's one of the huge challenges that the FDA is trying to face uh, right now with this guidance because they're coming across so many different devices. And, you know, so that's where this guidance is a good starting point in um, helping manufacturers, human factors, engineers um, understand, you know, what they're looking at, what are the questions they're looking at for approval. Um, but, <laughs> of course, the manufacturers on the other side look at this guidance and I think uh, one of the challenges is look at this guidance a little bit, literally, um, and trying to interpret it and apply it to their product has been one of, um, you know, the, the common challenges that they come back to the FDA with. Um, so it was just really interesting. But I think that through a lot of these discussions, a lot of these, you know, challenging points um, between the two, you, they raised the, the ultimate point that, you know, regardless of the perspective that you're coming in from, you know, the FDA from this more regulatory perspective and then manufacturers trying to innovate while getting their product out at really quickly, you know, very different perspectives, but they're ultimately trying to provide products that are the safest, most effective, uh, most usable for the, the people that they're trying to provide for. So that's that's an interesting challenge, and I, something that I didn't even think about. So there's there's a separate sort of pathway for these devices, and there's a separate pathway for these drugs, and they're they have to sort of um, talk to each other in or, in order to get things approved, right? Is that what I'm understanding? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's yeah the the manufacturers and the centers, yeah. Yeah, so that's I mean there's a big focus on on process at HFES this year, right? How can we improve the process of these sort of uh regulatory things, right? So like uh I, there was oh gosh, I don't I don't remember the guy's name, but the 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 cop who who gave the big speech about um how we need to improve sort of the the it's like criminal justice reform and not the it's the system that we need to fix and not the not the policing police reform versus po I'm rambling but the point is it's focused on the process and that kind of mm -hmm. sounds like like we're we're now identifying that yes this is a process that has its challenges associated with it and we need to talk to each other uh, in order to get it through both of these processes but maybe sometime in the future there could be um, a more streamlined or effective way to get things through these processes. Mm -hmm. And it's really hard because, you know, the, in the guidance, you know, the, the human factors validation study is the one requirement for getting your, your device through. And so a lot of times I think manufacturers still focus it as um, human factors is the, the checkpoint in the process. And the FDA actually in both these centers are very cognizant of the benefit of having human factors throughout the process, starting with the beginning, starting with risk evaluations, heuristic evaluations, formative evaluations, all these early um, activities that a human factors practitioner can get involved in. So they're, you know, pushing for human factors to come earlier. Um, 
but you know, it's it's always a struggle, especially I think in industry of how do we get innovative products out on the market as quickly as possible, and then still meet these rigorous, you know, high demand uh, requirements for a validation study. I mean, you take a look at a device that's meant for a surgeon, and for these um, validation requirements, you need at least fifteen users from each unique group. So if you've got, you know, just um, you know, surgeons are, are one group. And so that's 15 surgeons that you have to find. And, um, you know, surgeons are on high demand and they're very expensive. And, and that's just one user group that you're looking at. And a lot of times with these devices, you have to think of, you know, the whole gambit, you know, is this device going to be in the hospital? Is it going to be in the home? Is it going to be both? Um, is this going to be for smaller children so they have to have a parent help them or is this completely for self-administration? You know, it's a lot of questions to ask, but these are the things that the FDA is asking to make sure that once a device gets to the market, there aren't any surprise coming up later on. And I think like an important way that the FDA and human factors practitioners themselves can really help in this situation is I know that we are, we are the very end all validation study that has to be done. But I think by the FDA guidance, having that laid out that way, it's ultimately leading for this bias for manufacturers who are very focused on one, producing a safe product, but two, reaching a bottom line and reaching it quickly that, yeah, they're, they're only going to consider the human factors validation test as the last piece because that's what's in the minimum guidance they need to be able to create this product and get it out on the market. And I think if, with help from the FDA and making it more well-known, similar to how we're seeing like UX design proliferate in Silicon Valley companies, like it, it is having these people that work in human factors to the left of your product design, not just your validation testing design, that ultimately help you create a product that might be a little have a little bit more of an edge than it did without them. And if, and but on the flip side of the coin, I mean, as much as it would help for the FDA to kind of spell it out in different ways and their in their guidance beyond just the validation testing need, it's it's kind of part of our job as human factors practitioners or UX designers, whatever you want to call or whatever profession you're in, is to really when you work with companies or within your own company you work with now, if you're not a consultant, really con conveying to other people what processes make sense and how what you do is really going to help drive a product's innovation. Because I think even now at the time we live in with uh, such a big tech boom all over the place, some of these smaller companies that maybe are still growing or the government or DOD really still need that big push from human factors practitioners to like bring it to the forefront of their minds, like what impact this actually has on products. Yeah. And I think that, um, another thing that came through, um, was that the FDA provides this guidance and they recognize that it's in very general terms. Um, and they'll provide examples. Like if you see this, then do method X and, a lot of presentations that I w would attend, FDA would also attend, um, the presenters would say, well, if you do this, then you do method X. Um, like it was this definitive uh, pathway. And the FDA would step in and, and say, you know, this is a suggestion, this is guidance. And if there are other ways of uh, providing this data, trying to answer the questions that are coming up, then, you know, I mean, they, they let you justify that. And I think piggybacking off of Blake's point, us as human factors practitioners have a certain level of expertise and understanding how we can, um, you know, objectively get a lot of this data uh, through different methods, whether it be a literature review or, or um, less formal formative evaluations or, you know, um, a couple validation studies, you know, different methods. And we can leverage our expertise in justifying our use for that. Then um, that seems to be a very um, engaging uh, point for the FDA to, you know, then coordinate on, you know, are there still questions left over, but they seem very open to engaging in that type of communication. Well, I'm going to go ahead and move us on to our next topic here just for time. Uh, so at least this, this other one that you have here is latest advancements in human factors for surgical robots. And I got to say 
surgical robots. That sounds cool. Was it cool? It's super cool. <laughs> Nick, this is something that's very near and dear to my heart. <laughs> um, have you ever heard of the Intuitives Da Vinci robot? I have. I, I feel like I may have heard it in passing. Okay, I'm going to explain it because I get really geeked out about it. <laughs> and it's not just intuitive. It's actually a lot of different companies. So actually, um, there are videos on YouTube. I totally recommend if you haven't seen these, Google, you know, the Da Vinci system. Um, apparently, MIT came out with a review of the six coolest surgical robots recently. Um, so checking out those, I think, will give you a good breath in some of the, the surgical robots that are out or coming out right now. Um, but starting with Intuitive, so they started in uh, the late 1990s, I believe. Uh, but essentially, this isn't a robot who's taking over the entire surgery. It's still a surgeon that's involved. Um, but the surgeon is at a console that's oftentimes in the corner of a room. And the surgeon is there uh, controlling this robot that is essentially hooked into a patient. And there are a number of different team members around that patient and around that robot um, that are all working together to make sure that you know the patient's still doing um, fine, that they're supporting the, pa the surgeon who is currently not scrubbed in. Um, and it's just, it's such an interesting thing um, to observe. There's so many moving parts, uh, you know, from the surgeon who has his face in this console looking at a 3D image of what's inside the patient. Um, and then you have the patient a bedside surgeon who's sitting right there next to the robot, next to the patient, moving the camera inside the patient's body, uh, moving, you know, suction devices and, and supporting the surgeon and two of them are coordinating. And then you've got nurses around and the anesthesiologists. It's just, it's fascinating. There's so many moving parts. Um, but this panel was really interesting. They had representatives from Medtronic, Intuitive um, and Farm Product Development talking about uh, ways that they saw this industry moving forward. And it was kind of unique because essentially you had three competitors sitting next to each other on a panel uh, trying to talk about how they were going to move forward without disclosing too much. Was that awkward at all? Because I feel like that would be uh, really know. awkward. <laughs> well, some, some people were fuming. Yes, some people were fuming. <laughs> it's definitely an interesting uh, panel to observe. <laughs> Um, but it was just so interesting. I mean, one of the guys, uh, representative from Medtronic, got up and he started talking about um, what's called reprocessing. So if anyone has been paying attention to some of the, the sub-headlines in the news <laughs> over the past year, um, there have been some cases recently in the, in the VA, recently in Cedars-Sinai, of patients getting um, infected from equipment that has been reused. Uh, so in robotic surgery, as you can imagine, there are a ton of different moving parts. And uh, some of it is, you know, taken off the robot, sanitized, cleaned, and then put back on so that it can be used for another surgical procedure. Um, and there have been cases of cross-contamination from uh, these pieces of equipment not being cleaned thoroughly enough. And you look at the design of them, and it's amazing that any of them can be fully cleaned because there are nuts and bolts and all sorts of angles. It's They're quite complex. And then you go to the, the company and they say, oh, yeah, well, we've got all these instructions for this one piece of equipment. But then you go to the actual environment where this is being conducted and it's one technician who's doing a whole bunch of these all at once. And so now to take uh, all those procedures for every single piece of equipment now is a huge burden on what has traditionally been a low paying job uh, with a high turnover. So it's just a lot of um, expectation on this particular position um, and not something that designers have had in the forefront of their minds when developing this equipment. So that was one topic um, that had been talked about, not only in this panel, but a couple of other panels, um, just figuring out, you know, what are some ways that we can mitigate this cross-contamination risk? What are some ways that we can um, build in a better sterilization process so that we can um, prevent this from happening. So that was one of the, the things, um, not as exciting as they are, but, you know, one of those things that when you don't take a systems approach and thinking about the entire 
uh, use of the device then you know can be overlooked and so important. At least just for everybody in case they've never heard of it, what do you mean when you talk about the, taking a systems approach? Yeah, that's that's a good question. So systems approach. So you can think of just the device and the user. So for example, with robotic surgery, you can think about one of these um, pieces of equipment that's going inside the patient. And you can think about how that's supporting the surgeon performing, uh, you know, the actual procedure and the interaction there. <clears throat> and so that's very, you know, like user centric, user and device. Um, but taking a systems approach, it's, it's taking it up a level, thinking about the larger aspect, like the whole life of this device. So how do you take it out of its packaging? How do you hook it up to this robot? You know, and then how is it used in this procedure? But then after the procedure, how is it, how is it cleaned and sanitized? What happens to it after? How is it stored? It's, it's looking at the larger context of this one device within the larger organization that it's living in. Gotcha. Yeah. So we talked a little bit about this yesterday. I mean, because we I walked through some of the reprocessing uh, talks that we had gone through and definitely the the robotic surgery items came up kind of towards the end a little bit. And I think somebody actually brought up a really good point in one of the talks I sat in. And I think at least you were there, too, is like when you're de designing a device that has to go through this procedure, literally including something on the device or built in that provides the user feedback that they've actually completed the task. They've cleaned something to the maximum amount they need to for it to be, excuse me, reused, which is a really big deal in robotics. Um, when it, what, or it sounds like it is from your perspective, since there's so many moving parts potentially. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and the other part of it too, um, just another topic that came up during the panel had to do with uh, automation. Um, you know, so there's these ideas later on of, of robots taking over surgery or, or remote surgical operations. Um, I don't think we're quite there yet. Um, but there was one person up there who was talking about how to automate some of the surgeon's tasks. And there was this really interesting, dis um, and I think of these surgeons who are highly skilled specialists and it's, it's an interesting question, but I don't know what asks like this, you know, sterilization, reprocessing, pretty standard, um, doesn't rely on different biological components of different going that are not cleaned entirely thoroughly, but you know, it's not as, uh, absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, maybe that's, a so, so you mentioned the Da Vinci robot and I didn't know it by name, but I do know bring kind of going forward do you think there is uh this is more I think there's uh, i have to ask do you think there's an application for vr here because they're looking already at a three for all intents and purposes a virtual object because th they're free floating uh vr uh sort of controllers that you know i just want your opinion on it since you know this is your wheelhouse <laughs> it's yours actually um, so that's one way that surgeons can start to get familiar with the more related to the actual procedure itself, right? Yeah, there's no, mm -hmm. you wouldn't have to clean any of the VR stuff, right? That's like the, the stuff that the, the, is it because it's in the same space. Hmm. What well, would be in the virtual reality? Well, I guess it would be more like a, like. Are are the would the controllers be reprocessed? Would uh are are the control methods that the um that the surgeon is using are those are those reprocessed? Like the actual controls that they're using, their hands are on those controls, or is it just the stuff that interacts with the patients and their innards? Yeah, <laughs> I hear Blake laughing in the, the background. <laughs> um, yeah, the so the reprocessing is actually for. Uh, the things that are inside the patient. So getting inside there, the surgeon actually um, isn't scrubbed in at all. So he's not close to the actual um, sanitized field around the patient. They're like all the way across the room. So anything that the surgeon is touching, the controls over there, the console that he's got his face shoved into, that's all um, outside of, of this sanitized area. So it's generally not part of the reprocessing cycle. Okay. Yeah, that kind of clarifies. And it goes to show uh, how naive I am with... 
this kind of topic, right? That's not something I know. And I'm sure, I'm not sure, but I, I'm, I'm hoping a lot of our listeners had the same kind of questions. Um, so I'm just trying to trying to voice for them right now. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, it's totally a new set of technologies. I mean, I came across this in grad school out of sheer happenstance, but I mean, it's still very new. When I say robotic surgery, people are like, what? Robots are operating? And <laughs> we're not there yet. But um, the technology is definitely new and very, very interesting. Yeah. All right. So we got to wrap this up. What are your closing thoughts of the healthcare symposium? Both of you. I'm gonna I'm gonna toss it off to Elise first, and then I'll get your thoughts, Blake. Your closing thoughts on the healthcare symposium for 2018. Oh my gosh! Just sum it all up in just a couple words. Um, oh, you can it use. Was so you can use more than a couple. <laughs> 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 um, the. Like I said earlier, I think just having all the different disciplines coming together uh, made such a rich conversation because sometimes at, you know, human factors conferences, you get a lot of human factors people together. And so you're kind of preaching to the choir. Um, whereas here you get people who are, you know, embedded in a hospital or researching or, um, you know, on the manufacturing side, having these discussions together, talking about challenges and then bringing them back. So I think that, um, for that alone, I think it's a very productive conference, really interesting stuff. Okay. How about you, Blake? <laughs> Honestly, I, I think it's a great stop for anybody to make if you're interested in human factors or healthcare or any if you're on the manufacturing side. Uh, it, mainly because, like just Elise, Elise just said, for us in the human factors field, it gets us outside of just human factors people. And we're now we're interacting across so many different domains from device design to process design to to the FDA in person and that kind of stuff. But what I found really fascinating was just the integration of such cutting edge technology like AR, VR, AI, and machine learning into applications that are gonna ultimately help help healthcare in one faster or another. Um, and then just to piggyback off of that, seeing so much of it being piloted by the DOD or from military contracts, that are applying it in a military context, such as like with VR with the medics or with the uh, the TBI instance with VR as well. But they're also extracting it from just being a, a useful context for the warfighter and putting it in a consumer context as well. So I just I found it to be very, very encouraging because I, I love seeing these intersections of technology. So honestly, I think this is going to be uh, a major stopping point for me every year. If I can make it to the conference, I will. Well, guys, I have to say, over here on my end, I have learned so much from you guys. And thank you so much for breaking down the Healthcare Symposium uh, for 2018. That's it for our coverage. Uh, we're done. Finito. No, no more Healthcare Symposium after today. We're done. What did you guys think? Did you guys learn something new? Let us know. Well, you can follow us all over social media. Head on over to the Human Factors Cast, LinkedIn, Facebook, or Twitter. We're at H Factors Podcast. Be sure to join the discussion on our SoundCloud or send us an email at humanfactorscast at gmail.com. If you, if you want to share your experience from the Healthcare Symposium, you can leave us a voicemail at 901-646-1432. That's 901-646-1HFC. You can also support us on our Patreon at patreon.com slash humanfactorscast. We bring these things to you ad-free because we love you and because... You know, frankly, we don't want to deal with all those people. But you know what? It's 100% listener supported. So please go and, and help us out if you can. If not, go ahead and like, subscribe, review us on Apple Podcasts, wherever podcasts are handed out for free. Just give us a review and, and make it good. We'll call it even, I guess. And, of course, you can always reach us at our home on the web, humanfactorscast.com. I want to thank my panel for being here on the show today. Elise, where can our listeners find you on LinkedIn, right? On LinkedIn, that's right. Perfect. Blake Arnstorf, where can our listeners go and find you? Oh, you guys can find me across social media at Don't Panic UX. As for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me on LinkedIn or Twitter at Nick underscore Rome. Thanks again, guys, for tuning into the Human Factors Cast Healthcare Symposium bonus episodes. Until next time, it depends. It depends. It depends.